we are quickly approaching spring. I saw a couple of robins in the backyard this week, and that may not be a sign of spring, but there was a baseball game on TV yesterday, so spring is here. <laughs> like it or not, spring is here. Let's take just a moment to greet each other in the name of Christ. And if you're not happy shaking hands, bump elbows. As you make your way back to your seats, as you make your way back to your seats, a few announcements that I want to lift up this morning. We have a rose on the altar table for Bob and Nancy Hall's first great-grandchild. His name is Jetson Lee Jones. And mom and baby are doing fine. He came a little earlier than expected, but everybody's doing well. I want to say a, a word of congratulations to Ian Greenlaw and Mary Beth Cedarberg for a fabulous production of Pirates of Penzance over at Millican. If you haven't seen it yet, there's one more performance this afternoon, but I think they are sold out. Is that what I heard? We have. We have indeed. But you, know, you never know. Sometimes, sometimes people turn and take it last minute. Okay, so some, if, if you want to go, go over and see if you can get some last minute tickets. Um, we went Friday night. It was absolutely fabulous, and I was really very pleased to see the number of First United Methodist people that came out to support the arts in our community and to keep an eye on me because I can't go anywhere without somebody having to keep an eye on me. <laughs> we have the last in our series of Sunday night movies tonight at 4.30. We will be watching the movie Wesley. It is a very well produced live action movie and Susanna Wesley is played by June Lockhart. So depending on what era you're from, she was either Lassie's mom or she was the mom on Lost in Space. So. This week does begin the Lenten season. We will have Ash Wednesday worship here in the sanctuary at 12.15 and at 7 o'clock. The 1215 service, we will be very conscientious to keep that to 30 minutes so that you can come over your lunch hour if that works for you. There are some books out here on the welcome table that I want to bring to your attention. The first one is a little pink and purple one, and it's called 40 Devotions for Lent. It's a book of devotions for Lent. So please pick one up. You are welcome to it. The other one that is out there is called The Grace of Les Miserables. And I'm going to be using this as part of the um, foundation for my sermons during Lent. So if you want to read along with me, pick it up. If you um, decide that your small group or Sunday school class wants to do it, let me know and I can get more copies ordered for you and get you a leader book and a video and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. We are going to put off our mission moment until next week. So let's begin to think about grace. The United Methodists have always had a firm foundation in <clears throat> grace. That's who we are. Grace, that unmerited, undeserved love of God offered to us freely and without price. 
But do we accept it? Or do we turn our backs on it?
morning, everyone. Good morning. Please stand for the call to worship. Grace, God's grace. Grace, God's amazing grace. Grace, God's ongoing grace. Grace, perfecting, justifying, sustaining us. Our opening hymn is, By Grace We Have Been Saved. Please remain standing for a responsive reading of Psalm 32. This can be found in the red hymnal on page 766 and it will be projected on the wall. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When I did not declare my sin, my body wasted away through groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as I was in the I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. Therefore, let those who are godly offer prayer to you. At the time of distress, the rush of great waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You encompass me with deliverance. Do not be like an unruly horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. Many are the pangs of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you have right in your heart. You may be seated.
That was very nice. Please join me in the unison prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Let us be in a time of silent prayer. God of comfort and God of challenge. We come before you this day from many different places. Some of us are seeking meaning in the chaos of our lives. Some of us are seeking wholeness and strength in the midst of frailty. Some of us are too comfortable and need to be shaken into activity for you. We all come with hearts filled with thanks for the knowledge that wherever we might find ourselves in life, you are with us, giving us hope, peace, encouragement, and grace. Remind us that we should never be reluctant to come to you with our needs, our thanks, and our praises. We know that there are so many in our community who are suffering this day. We ask that you send your presence in a special way to those who need healing, those who need comfort or strength, those who just need to know that they are not alone in this world. Open our eyes to the many opportunities that you will set before us in the week to come to be the physical manifestation of your presence to others. We lift in prayer our first responders and our military members serving both nearby and far away. Keep them safe in your care until once again they return home to their family and friends. We offer these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Placing her in the center of the group, they said to Jesus, Teacher, 
This woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, Whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. And from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, At one time, you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to live like people of the world. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At one time, you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has showed us in Christ Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It is not something you possessed. It's not something you did you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we stand before your word, May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Although we are actually a few days before the official beginning of Lent on Wednesday, I am choosing to begin my Lenten sermon series today. And during this season of Lent, we are going to focus on grace. How we receive grace, how we give grace, what it means to live as people of grace. As I mentioned earlier, helping to shape this series is 
little study book called The Grace of Les Miserables. The, arth, the author, Matt Rawl, who is a United Methodist pastor in Indianapolis, has written several different studies using different movies or literature from pop culture. You might be familiar with uh, his one on Scrooge that's usually done during Advent. Now, some of you may have read Les Miserables in its full 1,400-page format. If so, I bow to you. I like to read, but I have limits. Others of you might have read a condensed version, maybe even the Cliff Notes. If you're like me, you are probably most familiar with this story through the Broadway musical and the subsequent movie made of the musical. So during this series, I'm going to use some of the characters that we find in this story. But if you've never even heard of the book before, you're not going to be lost, I promise. So let's start where the story starts. It is early 1800s in France. And revolution against the government is in the air. And we are introduced to Jean Valjean. As we meet him, he is being released from prison. He has spent 19 years at hard labor. Five years for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his sister's starving children, and another 14 for his escape attempts. Even by the standards of that time, that was pretty harsh. When Valjean leaves prison, he is a broken and pessimistic man. His time in prison has turned him into an angry man, angry at the world and all the people in it. He sees only the worst in the world, sees the world as a dog-eat-dog -dog place with no hope and no beauty. He has spent the better part of 20 years living in a world like that, a world where it's every man for himself. He has no home and no family waiting for him at his release. He tries to get a job, and every time they find out that he is a prisoner on parole, he loses the job. So he wanders the streets, and he encounters a bishop of the church who has a soft spot in his heart for Valjean. And he invites Valjean into his home, gives him supper and a place to spend the night. During the night, Valjean gets up and steals all of the silver from the bishop's home and runs away. And he is immediately caught by the police. He tries to claim that the silver was a gift from the bishop. But the police aren't really buying it. So they return him to the bishop's home so that the bishop can identify him as the thief. Since this theft would be a violation of his parole, Valjean is now facing a life sentence at hard labor. Yet, when he is brought before the bishop, the bishop insists that the silver was a gift to Valjean. He even hands over another set of silver candlesticks, saying, you left so quickly you forgot these. Valjean is released by the police. 
stunned by all this, Valjean faces the bishop. And the bishop tells him to use this silver in a way that would help him become an honest man. He tells Valjean, I have bought your soul for God. He affirms that Valjean is a beloved child of God regardless of his past. He is worthy of forgiveness and he is worthy of another chance. He offers Valjean a future that Valjean had never even imagined. And this is grace. Complete, unmerited forgiveness, unconditional love. More than that, grace is an opportunity for a clean start, a second chance, erasing what is past. This grace that is offered to Valjean by a stranger. A stranger who was wronged by him. And it is offered with no conditions. It is offered without him asking. It's even offered with a little extra blessing. Those two candlesticks piled on top, kind of like the cherry on top of the Sunday of Grace. Now, Valjean's life and outlook do not change immediately. It takes years for him to fully understand this gift of grace. And even longer for him to learn to offer this grace to others. But this is the moment when his life starts to change. Little by little. Slowly. It all begins with the action of this bishop who acts in grace. It reminds me very much of the encounter that Jesus had with that unnamed woman who was dragged before him as he sat teaching on the temple steps. And she was accused of adultery. Now, her guilt is not in question. She is unquestionably guilty. She had been caught in the act. And her accusers were absolutely correct. The law said that the punishment for her crime was public stoning to death. And Jesus didn't argue with them. He simply offered them an option. Whoever could claim perfection could begin the public stoning. One by one, they all crept away. The scriptures tell us that the elders went first. I think that's the wisdom that come with age when you know that that's not me. I'm not the sinless one. And when everyone who accused her had gone, Jesus offered to her God's astounding grace. He did not condemn her, even in the face of her unquestioned guilt. She knew she was guilty. She didn't need Jesus to tell her that. He publicly blessed her in the hearing of all these people who had gathered to listen to him teach. And he dismissed her with the encouragement to change her life. Go and don't sin anymore. And everyone there heard this encounter. 
by grace, Jesus had restored her to a new life, a second chance, and restored her to society through forgiveness. She was guilty. That is not in question at all. But was her life beyond the possibility of redemption so that she deserved to die for her mistake? Jesus didn't think so. He offered her forgiveness. He thought she deserved a second chance, or maybe it was a third or a fourth or a fifth chance. This is grace. Forgiveness, redemption, a new chance offered without strings, without price. It just needs to be received. Paul offered a little insight into the idea of grace as he was writing to the church at Ephesus. He said, grace is what saves us. It is offered to us without price. It is free if we will accept it through faith. Divine grace that leads to forgiveness, that leads to second chances, that leads to salvation is not something we can earn, not something we can buy, not something we can do for ourselves. It is the gift of God through Christ. It's God's desire to remain in relationship with us. The grace extended by God allows us to return to that relationship when we have broken it through our own sin. But it's not forced on us. In faith, we have to reach out, not very far, just, just a little bit. And God pours that grace over us. Allowing us to move forward in the new life that God has for us. Jean Valjean had a hard time accepting grace at first. It was a new concept that someone might see worth in him. Might care for him. Might give without expecting something in return. He could not understand why this bishop would not only forgive him, but actually lie to the police to assure his freedom. Valjean had never met that bishop before that evening. Yet, this bishop, this stranger, treated him with honor and with dignity as a person of worth, not as a criminal or a thief. That's what grace is all about. It took a lot of time for Valjean to fully accept that grace that was being offered to him and then to understand it as grace from God. And when he did, he was then able to offer that grace to others. To an orphan, to a jailer, to many others that he met on his journey. You see, grace first is to be received. And then it's to be shared. I have no doubt that the woman who received that grace from Jesus in front of the entire community remembered every day that moment and the way 
that it felt for someone to treat her as a person of worth. And I'm pretty sure that she did what she could to share that grace with others the rest of her life. She had learned that she was a forgiven, beloved child of God, even with all of her sin. And then she was able to treat others in the same way. You see, grace received is life-changing. When we have truly experienced and fully received the grace that God is offering to us, we cannot walk away unchanged. It's impossible. When we truly know what it is like to be given another chance, a clean slate, unconditional love. When we really know that, that is when we learn to share grace with others. And just maybe, as we learn to share grace with others, something will happen in their lives. Maybe they will realize that they are important. They are a beloved child of God, flaws and all. Maybe their heart might be open just a little bit to hear from God, to receive that grace directly from God as God reaches out to touch them. Maybe they're a little more receptive. In some way, we are all Jean Valjean. We need grace, and we have to learn how to accept that grace from God and from others. We need reminders that in the midst of our faults and our failures and our sins, We are valued children of God, worthy of forgiveness, worthy of a second or third or tenth chance. You and I have been saved by grace. It is a free gift from God offered without price. All God asks is that we open our hearts just enough to receive that grace because God thinks we are worth it. Amen. We have been blessed by God in so many ways. Let us now share what we have been given through our tithes and our offerings.
Gracious God, we give you thanks for the many good gifts that you bring into our lives each and every day. We ask that you accept these gifts as we return them to you to be used for your honor and your glory here on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us remain standing as we join together in our closing hymn, Freely, Freely. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, knowing that God's grace is poured out on you, not because you deserve it, not because you've earned it, but because God thinks you're worth it. Amen. <laughs>